Okay, so I'm Sarah Bradley. I'm a genetic counselor with the newborn screening program for New York State, and I specifically work in the follow-up area. So I'm here today to talk to you all about um, some of our preparations um, in the follow-up area for ALD screening and sort of what our process is for these babies that are then referred after what Joe was talking about. Um, so this is just an outline of what I'll be talking about today, um, starting off with a, just a little bit of context about why and how we're creating um, our diagnostic algorithm and our management guidelines. And then we'll review our diagnostic algorithm, which Joe put up briefly, but we'll kind of go through that a little bit slowly um, and see if anybody has any questions. Um, and then we're gonna review the management guidelines. Um, so, one question that you might have is just why would we, as a newborn screening program, create these? Um, and, I, and I shouldn't say that we created them. We helped really facilitate a discussion with our met metabolic geneticist around the state. Um, the goal of the diagnostic algorithm was to outline what they felt were the minimal steps needed to reach a diagnosis, um, either a diagnosis of ALD or proctosomal biogenesis disorder or Zellweger syndrome or, or what have you. Um, and for the management guidelines, it was also to facilitate a discussion um, and to provide guidance for practitioners, not just the metabolic geneticists, um, but you know, pediatricians wondering what's gonna happen with my, you know, my patient from here forward. Um, so this was gonna provide guidance for them. Um, the New York's, our program had previously facilitated these discussions for other disorders in the past, including prior to the start of Crab A disease. So we also have a precedent in New York State of having these types of discussions prior to starting a new disorder. Um, and just sort of a caveat down here that of course, these guidelines and algorithms are not a substitute for um, good clinical judgment. This is just sort of um, just guidance, but of course, clinical judgment um, might trump that. Um, so how are they created? It was really a group effort. Like I said, um, we helped facilitate the discussion, um, but it was done through a series of conference calls between the metabolic geneticists, and we have nine specialty care centers in New York State spread around the state. So we had nine metabolic geneticists, um, actually really 10, um, joining us in this discussion, as well as genetic counselors from each of these specialty care centers. Um, Dr. Raymond helped with these discussions a lot. Um, and then newborn screening program staff as well. Um, and from these, feedback was generated, they were revised, more feedback, revisions, you know, you can kind of get a sense of that. Um, we also had separate conference calls with pediatric neurologists from around the state as well as endocrinologists from around the state because um, of course we wanted to get their input. Um, and we also had a separate conference call with genetic counselors and just the genetic counselors that was one that Beth um, ran, and she kind of touched upon yesterday a lot of the topics that came up um, in that call. Um, we, these are still sort of in the process of being revised. Most recently, we had a meeting in September, an in-person meeting of our metabolic geneticists, not specifically to talk about ALD, but just to talk about all of our inherited metabolic disorders and kind of hot topics there, but ALD was certainly a topic, one of the hot topics. Um, and so they provided some feedback after everybody had had one or two patients um, an experience with um, positive screens. And so most recently, um, our algorithm was revised slightly in September. So first we'll go over the diagnostic algorithm. And so this is it, but just I should say, you know, as Joe mentioned before, any baby who screens positive after the first and second tier on our screen becomes a referral regardless of the results of their third tier, which is that DNA sequencing. Um, so again, if they have those elevated C26 after tier one and two, they're gonna be a referral. And in general, what our referral process is, is our follow-up staff will call and notify the baby's pediatrician um, as well as the metabolic geneticist at the closest um, specialty care center to where the um, baby was born. Um, and then the metabolic geneticist and the pediatrician will coordinate to have the baby come and get further evaluation at the specialty care center, center um, 
usually in a pretty short time frame. And don't worry, I'm not going to expect you to be able to read all of this, but so we're just going <laughs> to, yeah. so we're just going to kind of go through like arm by arm on here. And I should say, if it's probably easier if you have any questions, like please feel, to, feel free to ask it like as we're going through. Um, so for the first tier, again, this is, I should say, all the way back over here on the far left side, these are babies that do have an identified mutation in the ABCD1 gene. In this case, we're saying um, mutation or I guess it would also be a variant that we don't know what it is. And certainly we've had some that aren't described in the literature at all. Um, so you can see there, um, sorry, I keep flipping back and forth, but um, so the babies, again, had an identified mutation, and then we have different pathways for male babies and female babies. So the pathway for male babies, um, when those babies first come into the specialty care center, um, the group had decided that, you know, doing confirmatory, very long chain fatty acids on those babies was going to be very important. Um, the newborn screening program, we request um, a confirmatory sample from the baby. We also request samples from the parents, um, well, actually, excuse me, from mom, um, in this case, for the male babies, um, to determine if she is a carrier. Um, and if those babies persist, if their um, C26 um, is persistently elevated on that, this is confirmation that that baby does have um, X-linked ALD. Then for those female babies that are identified as having an ABCD1 mutation, um, this is actually one place where we recently made a change. Um, those newborns, when they were going to the specialty care center, we had been requesting, the group had, just, had been requesting um, very long chain fatty acids on those babies. Um, at our recent September meeting, um, the group thought that that was really probably not necessary for the, these baby girls. Um, so they are collecting um, a repeat sample, a newborn screen for the baby for us. Um, they are also sending parent samples on both parents um, to see if mom is a carrier or if perhaps dad is, um, has the mutation perhaps has a later onset form. Um, and then again, depending, if the baby has, um, uh, and again, we're not redoing the very long chain fatty acid, but um, most likely these babies are just are carriers of ALD. Um, and I don't mean to say just carriers, because we know that that you know, comes with its own set of con consequences possibly. Um, but these baby girls are most likely carriers of ALD. Um, we did recommend, of course, that if the doctor um, during their evaluation with the baby noticed any clinical symptoms of a paroxysomal um, biogenesis disorder. Of course, in theory, it would be possible that a baby girl could be a carrier of X-linked ALD and have another um, paroxysomal disorder, um, although that would hopefully be a very unlikely scenario. But um, it, so we did try to account for that, though, on this algorithm. So the next kind of big grouping of arms on here are babies that um, have no mutation or variance of uncertain significance in the ABCD1 gene on after the sequencing. Um, and one thing I should have said before I started going through this is this algorithm will probably um, differ from state to state because I know not all states when doing ALD screening may be able to do ABCD1 sequencing, and so if your state is not doing ABCD1 sequencing, it's very likely this algorithm may look quite different. Um, so, but these babies that um, did not have a mutation, again, they're referred to the specialty care center. The first step for all of these babies was to order very long chain fatty acids and a plasmalogen, and that this is for baby boys and baby girls. And then depending on the results of that blood work, we have um, three kind of basic different arms. So babies that have elevations in the very long chain fatty acids and low plasmalogen, um, we rec 
the recommendation from the group was that they should really be looking closely for any clinical signs of Zellweger syndrome and perhaps consider um, further diagnostic testing, perhaps a skin biopsy um, um, or genetic testing um, of the genes that, that ca cause Zellweger syndrome um, because that kind of pathway um, was very suggestive of Zellweger syndrome. So, um, so these are the evaluations that would lead to that diagnosis. The next arm for that pathway are babies that have elevated very long chain fatty acids and then a normal plasmalogen level. Um, so for these babies, there's actually, we're gonna go through, there's basically, for babies that fall into this category, there's three different arms. This is the first of the three arms. So the first one is our babies that have no clinical evidence of any of these other um, proctosomal um, biogenesis disorders. Um, for those babies, th they still have that persistent elevation in the very long chain fatty acids. Um, and so we, the group had recommended follow-up testing of very long chain fatty acids in the mom um, and siblings, um, and then possibly also doing MLPA to look for any large deletions or duplications in the ABCD1 gene that were missed during sequencing. Um, and you know, if that was confirmed to be the case, um, the recommendation from the group was to order um, studies on fibroblasts to confirm that, and perhaps these babies, again, this is thought to be a pretty unlikely, uh, unlikely scenario, but not impossible, um, but these would be babies that actually had X-linked ALD that we didn't detect on sequencing. So another um, arm of the babies that have the elevated very long chain fatty acids and normal plasmalogen. Um, so another possibility, of course, is that the babies do have on exam some evidence of um, a proxosomal biogenesis disorder such as acyl-CoA oxidase deficiency or B bifunctional protein deficiency. Um, the group, this is another spot where a change was made in September because the group at this point really thought it would be helpful to do next-gen sequencing for these babies. Um, to help determine whether they had, you know, which of the two disorders they had. Um, um, and then the last arm of these babies that have elevations in the very long chain fatty acids and normal plasmalogen are ones that have evidence of a paroxysomal, paroxysomal disorder, um, but further testing is really inconclusive, um, and so Ultimately, these babies are ones that the group felt still had, you know, the evidence suggested that there was some proxosomal disorder at work, um, but the etiology of that was not clear. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's a little bit of unknown still surrounding these babies. Now, the final arm on our algorithm is probably really the most clear one, and those are babies that, um, on further um, testing had normal very long chain fatty acids and normal plasmalogen. Um, and these are babies that then are said to have no evidence of disease. So next, if nobody has any questions about the diagnostic algorithm, I'll go over the management protocols that were produced by the group. Um, these cover different time points. They cover um, basically recommended evaluations at the time of the diagnosis for the baby, um, and then also for boys that are asymptomatic during the childhood years, and then once those individuals get older, um, following them after the age of 18. So at the time of diagnosis, um, these were the evaluations that were recommended, and actually Dr. Um, Raymond talked about this briefly yesterday too, so I won't belabor the point, but you know, certainly at the time of diagnosis, establishing with endocrinology and neurology is very important. Um, and then with endocrinology, specifically doing a serum ACTH and cortisol levels, um, and then with neurology, um, an initial evaluation 
genetic counseling might be helpful for the family at this time. It also might be a very overwhelming time for them and it might not be the ideal time for them. Um, that, you know, that'll be really an ongoing discussion with the family. Um, now for boys during childhood, these were the, what the group um, recommended as sort of like the optimal timing of evaluation. So for endocrinology, the clinical evaluations um, from when the baby is um, one year old to about a year and a half, um, you know, the group felt that the baby should be having at least an annual exam, um, but in the meantime be having, um, oh, excuse me, excuse me, 18 years, not 18 months. Um, but in the meantime, the baby should be having um, regular um, ACTH and cortisol levels every six months. Um, and for neurology, the clinical evaluation meeting with the neurologist and having an exam, that was um, suggested that, that that should be done at least annually um, from age six months all the way through 18 years. Um, the MRIs um, are suggested starting at age six months like Dr. Raymond reviewed yesterday. Um, and then from that point onward annually, um, except for sort of the critical time period of when the baby is or that I should say the boy at this point is three years old to 10 years. Um, and as we've heard, that's of course the very kind of critical time, but during that age, the MRI should be done every six months. Um, after that, they can go back to doing annual exams. Um, and then again, a clinical evaluation and counseling um, with genetics um, that can be done at the discretion of the specialist, also at the discretion of the family and what they feel might be helpful for them. And then finally, um, the guidelines for um, asymptomatic men now after the age of 18. Um, so for endocrinology and for neurology, the child or the young, the young adult at this point is going to have to transition to the adult endocrinology and adult neurology practice. Um, and at that point, they should be following with those groups every year. Um, at that point, for the, for the lab work, um, these young men can transition to having the ACTH and cortisol every um, annually, every 12 months rather than every six months. Um, and then the brain MRI without contrast um, would be annually, you know, and as Dr. Raymond said, you know, this is sort of what is optimal. Um, it, this might be a particularly difficult age time frame um, to, to get these um, individuals in. Um, and again, genetics is sort of available as a continued research, uh, excuse me, um, a continued resource for these um, boys and their families um, and can be utilized whenever it is appropriate for them. So um, another um, consideration that was included in the management recommendations was just when should the specialist start to consider um, referring the baby or the baby or the or the child for um, the stem cell transplant? Um, and it, you know, as we've been discussing, um, this is really only recommended or especially recommended during the very early stages of the cerebral disease. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Raymond talked on this yesterday, so I'm not going to belabor this point. But the less ALD MRI score. Um, if the severity score is greater than one and less than nine, so between one and nine um, is when the, um, you know, it was decided that the baby should be referred for the stem cell transplant and if the performance IQ is greater than 80. Um, so just in summary, what we've talked about um, is just We've reviewed our diagnostic algorithm, and again, like I said, um, that may look different from state to state depending if DNA sequencing is done um, as part of the screen. And we've also reviewed the management guidelines that New York State's um, metabolic geneticists put together. And I'd just like to thank um, Dr. Raymond, um, the newborn screen staff who worked on this, Beth, Joe, Michelle, um, as well as the metabolic geneticist in New York State that helped put this together. And if you have any questions, um, we would also be happy to email you or, or send you copies of any of these algorithms or management guidelines, certainly.
I don't expect you to remember everything that was in this presentation. Um, so um, feel free to send an email and we can send those along or if you send something to Bonnie, we can send it via her. Um, I know I'm supposed to remind everybody too that in the back of your folder, in the left hand side, there is an evaluation for the whole symposium. Um, if you can just remind, remember to be working on that and I think we're taking a break now and we're gonna be pass, passing out the post test to everybody and please fill that out and I heard a rumor that people won't get lunch if they don't fill out their post test, so <laughs> yes. Thanks. Um, I was just looking at the algorithm for um, the females that are uh, determined to be carriers. Mm -hmm. If um, with that particular algorithm, if you go back and you check and the father indeed has AMN, does that then change your, your evaluation for that particular female? If the father has AMN. So, so based on, based on the, the a criteria that we saw yesterday also, mm -hmm. we're, we're running the algorithm on the assumption that one parent, especially the mom, is a carrier. Mm -hmm. um, however, in the rare situation, and, and you'll find this with consanguineous populations, mm -hmm. if the father also has AMN, um, will then the determination of the mm -hmm. carrier status for that daughter so um, be altered? Both. Right, because yeah. then wouldn't then the, the daughter have a 50% chance of being a, a home double heterozygous um, person or a, a homozygous? Yeah, I think that's a good question and I don't think our algorithm really accounts for that kind of possibility, but I think that would be, you know, an important consideration for the geneticist evaluating right. and meeting with the family is to ask detailed questions and, and, and that's typically done usually as most, um, for most clinical eva uh, genetics evaluations is asking detailed family history questions, particularly about both parents and any kind of health problems or symptoms they might be experiencing. Okay. Um, and you know, and if that were the case, I think possibly ordering MLPA um, or for the girl um, to see if she possibly has any ar larger deletions or duplications that could be at play or doing that for, uh, for the father. And by extension, would you then go and screen all the others female siblings to find out if they're um, homozygous for, I mean, assuming the father and the mother have the same mutation. Yeah, um, that's a And then the other question I wanted to, to ask was from the actual sequencing, mm -hmm. do you find double mutations for the particular gene at, at some point or, or just single mutations? Um, Michelle's gonna go through for all of our referrals kind of the specific um, mutations that we have found so far and what we know about them. Um, for the most part, for the boys, we have found single, you know, the babies, the baby boys were hemizygous for a single mutation. Okay. Um, well, I think we've had a couple with other variants um, as well, um, but Michelle will provide, provide that data. But I mean, that's a good question you were asking about, would we test female siblings if there was a suspicion and I, I would, I guess I would ask Michelle. I, right, cause I, like. It's, we've been doing testing siblings very much on like a case by case basis and so. And then the wild question further down the line is if you're in a, testing a really highly consanguineous population mm -hmm. and you do have a case where you have a female who is homozygous mm -hmm. um, for, and then you ha and she mates with, the, has a husband who, <laughs> who, who ha has AMN, then all the kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. are going to be affected, so. Yeah, I, I can't mean, say that that's, <laughs> I mean, that that's a, you know, a, a situation that we could come across, and I can't say that actually that was discussed in our uh, discussions about <laughs> this, so, you know, that's something that we should probably bring back to the group and okay. just think about how would we handle that if, if and when that comes, so. Right. That's right, good, you got to be prepared for all these situations. For state labs that are doing their own sequencing, are you submitting mutations to any accessible databases? Or do you feel you don't have enough outcome data to submit them? Um, no. Yeah, we don't have enough, we don't have outcome data yet for anybody and we only, we have some mutations that are novel. Most of them are actually already in the database that um, was 
talked about yesterday and I have the URL on mine. Um, with Crab A, we have a very large database that we're trying to assemble into a, um, something that's gonna be available for newborn screening labs because what we're finding in newborn screening is very different from the clinical sequencing reports and the, the knowledge that's been accumulated there. We've also given a lot of our Crab A data to David Wenger to put in his chapter from newborn screening and APHL's molecular subcommittee group is working on a database to help the newborn screening community sort of at least have us deposit in one place or link to other places what's known about these variants that are detected in asymptomatic newborns. You might be covering this later. Are you going to talk about the, the novel mutations and the outcome in terms of the follow-up uh, guidelines that you've put, put together? You're going to talk about that. Sort of trivial. You, you recommend ACTH and cortisol. Is that a sensitivity issue? Predictive value is one better than the other? You have to do both? Or? Um, maybe Dr. Raymond wants to comment on that. So the ACTH will rise before the cortisol actually falls, but I think I think both of them give you some uh, valuable information. So the the ACTH is going to creep above. Uh, the 52, 53 cutoff that most labs uh, have, but the cortisol probably will remain normal until you're probably around two or three hundred. But I, but I think I think there's some value in, in, in they're fairly simplistic tests uh, in getting that information rather, and rather than go into an ACTH stimulation test in every single situation, 